Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're delighted you've decided to join us. We study the Sabbath School lessons as prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church, and this series is entitled The Seasons of Life. And this particular lesson, number four in that series, is entitled When Alone. It's the lesson for April 27 of 2019. And it's talking about loneliness in one way or another. So let's see what it has to say. But as usual, we begin with a word of prayer. Father, we thank you for the privilege we have of associating with you in every stage of our lives. Some of us have are surrounded with families, with children and spouses and so forth, and others seem to live much more lonely lives. Help us to understand the role that you want each one of us to play, whether we're married or single, um, alone or with many around us. Each day that may we learn something uh, that brings us closer to you is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. It's pretty clear that God, God never intended for us to be lonely. I mean, Adam, how long did he have to live all by himself as the only human being? Apparently less than a day. For sure, less than a day, less than half a day probably. <laughs> At least it may seem like that from reading the passage. So already he was married. That's, you suddenly show up on the scene and the next thing you know you're married. Wow. But there are times in our generation when people are lonely. And there's some very sad stories about being lonely and being unnoticed. Um, Carrie, I think you have something about that. Yes. God never intended for human yeah. beings to be lonely. One of the first things he did after humans were created was to perform the marriage ceremony. But unfortunately, there are times when people are lonely. A fascinating yet painful story made the news years ago. A young woman had been found dead in her apartment. Though the death was tragic itself, what made the story worse was that the woman had been dead for more than 10 years before being found. 10 years. Mm. Thus the question that people had asked, and rightly so, was how in a big city like this with so many people and with so many means of communication, could a woman who was not a street person have been dead for so long and nobody know? That came from the Sabbath School Study Bible Guy. Yeah. Study Guy. So you wonder, you know, if she lived in some kind of apartment or something, who was paying her rent? Yeah. yeah. And her utilities? And who was the landlord? Nobody was checking on her? I mean, had no friends of any kind? Well, you out there, have you ever been really lonely? How does it feel to be lonely? Do you know others around you that might be lonely? Can you, can you, can you tell? Can you tell by looking at somebody or listening to them, talking to them? Can you tell if they're really lonely? Well, look at some verses from Ecclesiastes. Now, we know that Ecclesiastes is a, uh, a book written by a tired old king who makes a lot of mistakes in his life. But this is what he wrote. Two are better off than one because together they can work more effectively. If one of them falls down, the other can help him up. But if someone is alone and falls, it's just too bad because there's no one to help him. If it is cold, you two can sleep together and stay warm. But how can you keep warm by yourself? Two people can resist an attack that would defeat one person alone. A rope made of three cords is hard to break. Now those are all pretty obvious conclusions, right? Well, <clears throat> many tasks, I mean, we recognize this, many tasks, it's just some tasks are really hard to do by yourself. It's all, almost always easier to do a task with someone else helping you. Some of us may feel comfortable and, and enjoy having periods of time alone. That, that's okay. But none of us can make it completely alone for a lifetime. First of all, we have to have parents. And even if those parents did not care much about us or were irresponsible, we would not exist without them. So how many people do you think, of, think there are in our churches, in the communities where we live, or even at work, that are lonely? 
One unmarried man said he was with, and this is someone from the church here, said he was with people all week long at work. On Sabbath, he was with people at church, but on Sundays, he felt very lonely. Is lonely a synonym for depression? For some people, it probably is. There are certainly other types of depression, but... Uh, mm -hmm. Well, I, I was thinking when I first read number three today, you don't, as far as I'm personally concerned, until you've lost your spouse, you really don't understand it. Yeah. I think that's true. And well, John sixteen thirty one to 33, Jesus said, Jesus answered them, Do not believe, do you believe now? The time is coming and is already here when all of you will be scattered, each one to your own home, and I will be left all alone. But I'm not really alone because the Father is with me. I have told you this so that you will have peace by being united to me. The world will make you suffer, but be brave. I have defeated the world. And then in Philippians 4, 11 to 13, and I am not saying this because I feel, this is Paul now speaking, I'm not, I'm not saying this because I feel neglected, for I have learned to be satisfied with what I have. I know what it is to be in need and what it is to have more than enough. I have learned this secret so that anywhere, at any time, I am content whether I am full or hungry, whether I have too much or too little, I have the strength to face all conditions by the power that Christ gives me. Now, so shouldn't that be the situation with someone, almost anybody who's lonely? Well, Jesus warned us clearly that difficult times may be ahead. We know that there's a time of trouble coming, don't we? Ellen, warned that, Ellen White warned that there's a time coming when we may, we may have to stand singly and alone. In Volume 5 of the Testament, page 707, paragraph 2. Does that sound exciting? Well, Paul understood what it was like to live a single life. At one time he had been married, but when he was changed by that experience on the Damascus Road, apparently his family abandoned him. But we need to remember that no matter what may happen, even if we are in prison or dying, God is still with us. And you know those words that God first spoke to Adam? or spoke in, in Adam's presence, or about Adam, then the Lord God said, It is not good for the man to live alone. I will make a suitable companion to help him. I want you to think about that for a moment. Who was with Adam at that, on that day, that afternoon? God and the angels. God the Father was there. Probably God the Son was there. The Holy Spirit was there, probably. A lot of angels were there. How could you be lonely with all of that? And all of nature. And all of nature. I mean, and, and not only all of nature, but they're coming by and you're, you're naming them and you're just getting acquainted with all those new creatures. I mean, think of the people. I, had, I have some friends staying with me right now who just come back from spending several weeks touring the game parks in Tanzania. And it's so exciting. You go and you go around a corner of something and there's a leopard or there's a lion or something. Oh, isn't that exciting? Well, what if you could just stand still and all the animals just came to you? Yeah. <laughs> I had a friend who you know also suggests that Adam didn't just name them. Oh, this is a lion, yeah. this is a giraffe, this is a, uh, an elephant, yeah. but actually studied them, classified and, them. Mm -hmm. um, Gave them descriptive names. Discerned the differences and what made them unique. Mm -hmm. So. Well, despite all that company, God still said to Adam, you need a companion, a human companion. And Eve was created, and we know that story. And then what did Adam say? Yes, Jackie, this should be <laughs> your, your... At last, here is one of my own kind. Bone taken from my bone and flesh from my flesh. Woman is her name because she was taken out of man. Wow. I had someone else who once said, and I never forget these words, you know, sometimes people say, well, man is superior to woman because the first woman was taken out of Adam. And the ladies are supposed to respond, and every other man from that day till now was taken out of woman. 
<laughs> of course, the story also goes, and God said, uh, well, he had made Adam, and he said, I can do better than that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We may assume that because someone is in a place where there are a lot of other people, they could not be lonely. That's far from truth. Yeah. That's a big mistake. People can feel very lonely even in crowded cities. So how do we discover who's really feeling lonely? Do you think you could detect when someone is really lonely? Sometimes. Sometimes people can hide it pretty much. Yeah. yeah. Um, do we understand how to reach out to people who are lonely? Are we willing to do that? Some of the people who are really lonely, it's because they're not very easy to be around. Yeah. <laughs> That's another problem. Well, how should we relate to those people? Do we have any examples of Jesus relating to people who are really lonely? Do you think the woman at the well, who is now working on husband five or six or whatever it is, thinks she was, because she was, why was she at the well in the middle of the day? She was shunned. It was the best time for her to be there. Do you, do you think she felt lonely? Yeah. Are there any other examples of Jesus speaking, dealing with lonely people that you know of? That yeah. lady that had the issue of blood for 12 mm. years probably stank to high heaven. I can yeah. only imagine. She would have been terribly lonely. Yeah. What about the rich young ruler? I thought about that at times. Yeah. Wonder why you're sorrowful or something. Mm -hmm. Well, the lepers were certainly outcast from yeah. society, but yeah. they had each other. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, uh, there are some groups of people who live a fairly lonely life, who live alone and do not even live with another person, at least not a friend. Are such people condemned to loneliness? I, I, I mean, every week I end up talking to someone who is, their family doesn't want them anymore, they get kicked out, or for whatever reason they choose to leave and then they don't have any really any place to go. Um, well, there are some people who choose to be unmarried because they feel less fettered by a spouse and family. It, may, make it makes it easier for them, for example, to just leave on a mission trip on a moment's notice if they want to. Some people like that. How many are included in that group? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, Not very many? Probably not. Well, look at 1 Corinthians 7, 25 to 34. Now concerning what you wrote, and this is Paul, remember? Now concerning what you wrote, this is a letter, this is a questions that have been sent to him from the church at Corinth, and he's in Ephesus. Now concerning what you wrote about unmarried people, I do not have a command from the Lord, but I give you my opinion as one who by the Lord's mercy is worthy of trust. So I should, since this is just Paul's opinion, we probably should cut it out of the Bible, right? <laughs> no. No? Give you another way of looking at it. <laughs> Considering the present distress, I think it is better for a man to stay as he is. Have you got a wife? Then don't try to get rid of her. Are you unmarried? Then don't, don't look for a wife. But if you do marry, you haven't committed a sin. And if you're, unmarried, a married, if you're an unmarried woman uh, and she chooses to marry, marry, she hasn't committed a sin. But I would rather spare you the everyday troubles that married people will have. What I mean, my friends, is this. There is not much time left. And from now on, married men should live as though they were not married. Those who weep as though they were not sad. Those who laugh as though they were not happy. Those who buy as though they did not own the, what they bought. Those who deal in material goods as though they were not fully occupied with them. For this world as it is now will not last much longer. Okay. Uh, actually, I would like you to be free from worry. An unmarried man concerns himself with the Lord's work because he's trying to please the Lord. But a married man concerns himself with worldly matters because he wants to please his wife. And so he is pulled in two directions. An unmarried woman or a virgin concerns herself with the Lord's work because she wants to be dedicated both in body and spirit. But a married woman concerns herself with worldly matters because she wants to please her husband. So there we have the challenges, right? Paul has some very careful advice for both the married and the unmarried. He suggested that if you're not married, you should remain that way. But if you're married, you do not separate from your spouse. He recognized that those who are married have a lot of worldly responsibilities. 
So he suggested that in light of the fact that he believed the second coming of Christ would be very soon, it, would, it was better not to marry. We are now two, almost 2,000 years closer to the time of the end than Paul was. How should we feel about Paul's advice now? Should we just look back and say, you poor deluded soul, Paul? But doesn't he also say it's better to marry than to burn? Mm -hmm. I didn't hear that there anywhere. <laughs> yeah. So he wasn't totally against it. No, 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 no. <clears throat> but we're 2,000 years later. Yeah. How should we feel about his advice? Dr. Maxwell tell, used to tell the story about his father and his mother. And they had some good friends, and they, it was, was during the Second World War. I'm, I'm sorry, it was during the First World War. During the First World War, and both these couples were trying to decide what to do. And his parents decided to marry, and the other couple decided, no, things are too bad, we're just not going to marry. Now, he says I, he never did hear what happened to the other, other couple, but he was sure glad that his parents decided to marry. <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Uh, yeah. Well, we don't know if Paul's, I think that Paul's advice is still valid advice, but uh, it doesn't seem quite so urgent right now. Is it, God, is it God's plan for everyone to eventually marry? Apparently not. Well, think of some very important people in the Bible who didn't marry. Jesus. The most important one, of course, was Jesus. Can you imagine what it would be like if he had married and had children? Mm -hmm. Wow. Jeremiah was not married. God told him not to marry. And although Ezekiel was in his early life, his wife died suddenly, and he was told not even to mourn. That doesn't sound too good, does it? And then there's the story of Hosea. Yeah. He was told to go out and marry a prostitute. Later in the story, he reali we realized that she went back to her old lifestyle and had two more children. That the first child was his. She had two more children that were apparently the result of her relationships with other men. Then God told Hosea to go and buy her back, and the price he was to pay was enormous. I don't know. I think he was lonely during all of that time. You wonder what happened to that first child. Mm -hmm. Is it possible that considering the state of the society in Hosea's day that maybe Gomer was the best choice that Hosea had available to him? Considering how decadent the society was, perhaps. You remember that... Uh, of course, God, ours is so much better. Huh? Yes, of course. Well, we know that God was trying to use the story of Hosea to illustrate the story of himself with the children of Israel. The northern tribes, Hosea was prophesying to the north, northern tribes at a time when they were within about 10 years of being completely wiped out. Uh, they had organized themselves into a nation called Israel, and they were about to be conquered and scattered by the powerful nation of Assyria, never to be heard from again. Well, but at least we can be certain that not everyone needs to marry. Our lives are not defined by our marital condition. And look at Romans 12, 1 and 2. So then, my brothers and sisters, because, God's great, because of God's great mercy to us, I appeal to you. Offer yourselves as a living sacrifice to God, dedicated to His service and pleasing to Him. This is the true worship that you should offer. Do not conform yourself to the standards of this world, but let God transform you inwardly by a complete change of your mind, then you'll be able to know the will of God, what is good and is pleasing to Him, and is perfect. So, is it possible to have a very meaningful life relationship with God? Do you think someone could do a Paul thing today? How would that work out? No, I think you can, uh, traveling is sure change. It's, it's, it's got similarities with a whole lot of differences too. So in order to be a, the kind of witness that Paul was, you'd, would you have to be employed by the church? It depends if you were doing it under the auspices of the church or whether you're doing it 
private missionary work, that happens occasionally, not often. Somebody yeah. wealthy goes and does something. Paul was probably fairly wealthy to start with. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, he ended yeah. up having to work to uh, survive, yeah. but he may have had some funds to. I will tell you an interesting story. Uh, back in the 1910s, so more than a hundred years ago now, my wife's grandfather, well, his, his grandfather and grandmother, um, were called by the church to go and work in India. And that was a time when, I mean, the Adventist church had barely anybody had been to India at all. I mean, it was almost a completely open field and nobody had done anything for the Adventist church. And so they said, we, we can't support you, but we would like you to go. So he went as a call porter yeah. mm -hmm. to work in India, to spread the gospel. And of course, there were two, in those days, it was a British protectorate. And so there were two groups of people that he would react with. The British, who were the relatively few, but relatively wealthy. And then there were the other local people. They started a, a school for girls, and they started a, a bunch of other things there. But um, after they'd been there for a while, the church said, well, we're doing a little better now. We'll, we'll, um, we'd like to employ you, and we'll give you a church salary. I said, no, thank you. I'm doing just fine. Mm -hmm. So yeah. <laughs> that, that was interesting. God supplies. Yeah. Well, what about joining an independent ministry? Is that, would that be all right? Or could you do it on your own? When, when it talks about, when Ellen White talks about our end up stand, being, being standing, you know, singly and alone, will we be just silent at that point in time or will we be witnessing at that point in time? Get the impression that we would be witnessing. Maybe even in before, court. Yeah, before a large number of people and or important people or court mm -hmm. and we're perhaps. not to worry because yeah. god will bring the words to our mind yeah what to say as so long as we have put it put that data put it in there. it's yeah. it's there and can be retrieved it's the retrieval process that's the hard part <laughs> or the input process if well, you put it in there <laughs> yeah if you can't if you well, don't put it in you can't get it out <laughs> well suppose that you're comfortably married and you're attending a small church do you feel comfortable inviting singles over to your home? Should our churches organize singles groups? Well, if you have a church as big as the university church here, uh, that's not too difficult. Uh, what if you, yeah? I'm going to say, I think I've read that some of our churches have done that. Mm -hmm. yeah. I think you need to be careful, but it's doable. Yeah. Yeah, and singles have some challenges. Uh, I mean, if you say, okay, all of us singles get together and there's only half a dozen of you and you go off on a picnic or something together, why people might start talking. Well, suppose you're comfortable, uh, I'm sorry, um, the next problem that deals with, with loneliness is, is the problem of divorce. Malachi 2.16 says that God hates divorce. Why is it then that in our world, not only in the world itself, but in the church, the divorce rate is about 50%? What do you think is the main reason for that? We make bad choices when we choose to get married in the first place? Yeah. Selfishness, keeping up with the Joneses, all kinds of reasons. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm sure, and I've said this before, I'm sure that God intends for us to learn a great deal about Him from our relationship to our spouses and to our children. So if that's true, what is the devil going to say about that? He's going to do everything he possibly can to disrupt marriages. Are young people particularly prone to making bad choices for companions in marriage? I don't think age is a... 
Well, I mean, we it's know we biggest, know that the average age for getting married is getting is extend is getting older and older in our society. Is the divorce rate any better? No. But the, the, no. the other side of the coin is you will read of experiences where kids get meet each other in high school and marry straight after, and they're mm -hmm. successful now. I think yeah. the the percentage of that are probably low, but it does happen. Mm -hmm. Well, um, there's no such thing as a good divorce. Does divorce hit harder to those who, quote, are divorced, feel like they're the innocent party? Or does it, or no, well, they feel, uh, the, their, their partner thinks they're the guilty party. Are those who feel so upset by the situation that they choose to, to divorce? What percentage of divorces take place amicably? There was a crazy situation recently that was on the news of some Hollywood star that uh, got remarried and took her children and her ex-husband was wanted to go in, so she just took her ex-husband too mm. on their honeymoon. Mm. It's weird. <laughs> you know, they, things are crazy, I tell you. I think children are the ones that suffer. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Or, 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 or is it correct to say that if there's a divorce, both sides are at fault? <coughs> and our society is usually the man who chooses whom he would ask to marry him. Women, of course, have the op option of saying no. How many women say yes because they're afraid no other man will ask them? Is that a good basis for choosing to marry someone? I won't ask you to comment about that, Jackie. Well, there, there certainly are a fair number of women who ask men also yeah. in this day. It's probably or more. It's, it's really a mutual, usually a mutual decision. Mm -hmm. Let's do this. Mm -hmm. Well, um, we probably have, well, I'm, we're running a little behind here, I think, on our schedule. There are some passages in the Bible, Matthew 5, 31 and 32, Matthew 19, 8, and 1 Corinthians 7. <laughs> Uh, 11 to 13 that talk about divorce. No matter what the overall circumstances, divorces are hard on all who are affected, especially the children if there are some. If there are some. The wonderful part, plan that God intended for marriage gets torn apart. Um, and Gordon, I think that's your turn. Oh, this actually comes from the uh, Seventh-day Adventist Church Manual as quoted in the Bible Study Guide. The church as a redemptive agency of Christ is to minister to its members in all of their needs and to nurture everyone so that all may grow into a mature Christian experience. This is particularly true when members face lifelong decisions such as marriage and distressful experiences such as divorce. When a couple's marriage is in danger of breaking down, every effort should be made by the partners and those in the church or family who minister to them to bring about their reconciliation in harmony with the divine principles for restoring wonderful relationships. Wounded relationships. Wounded, restor restoring wounded relationships, I'm sorry, yes. Resources that can be of assistance to members in the development of a strong Christian home are available through the church or other church organizations. These resources include, number one, programs of orientation for couples engaged to be married. So make a good choice of a good of a partner in the beginning, that helps. Two programs of instruction for married couples with their families, and three support programs of support for broken families and divorced individuals. Well, the church manual advises us to read Hosea three one to three, a, a few verses. Let's just look at those. Look at Hosea three one to three. The Lord said to me, Go again and show your love for a woman who is committing adultery with a lover. You must love her just as I still love the people of Israel, even though they turn to other gods and like to take offerings of raisins to idols. So I paid 15 pieces of silver. Now remember, a piece of silver is what a normal person, a normal laborer would earn for a whole day. So 15 pieces of silver and 150 kilograms of barley to buy her. That's a lot of money. I told her that for a long time she would have to wait for me without being a prostitute or committing adultery, and during this time I would wait for her. Wow. 
Well, look at 1 Corinthians 7, 10 and 11. For married people I have a command which is not my own but the Lord's. A wife must not leave her husband, but if she does, she must remain single or else be reconciled to her husband, and a husband must not divorce his wife. And that was, of course, in the days when wives didn't, divorce, didn't have the option of divorcing. Only the husbands had the authority to divorce. And then, of course, there's the advice from the love chapter, 1 Corinthians 13. And finally, Galatians 6, 1, My brothers and sisters, if someone is caught in any kind of wrongdoing, those of you who are spiritual should set him right, but you must do it in a gentle way and keep an eye on yourselves that you, so that you not be tempted to. Okay. How many divorces would happen if we all practiced the guidance of the love chapter? 1 Corinthians 13? Would a divorce be possible? Shouldn't be, right? Well, clearly the other verses suggest that even if a husband or wife are separated for a period of time, God would prefer that they get back together. Those who are having difficulties in their marriage should first seek a qualified Christian counselor who could at least suggest ways to improve such a relationship. But if, there, but if that is impossible, it is important to seek legal counsel to cause the least amount of disruption, pain, and anger that is possible, especially if there are children involved. The final separator that will ultimately affect all of us, uh, unless Jesus comes first, is death. Of all the traumatic things that impact a person's life, the death of a spouse is probably the worst. We all know that sooner or later we will die unless Jesus comes first. Think about Adam and Eve. Which one of them died first? We don't know. The death of the one who died first must have been terribly wrenching for the other one. Notice these words from Ellen White. As they witnessed in drooping flower and falling leaf the first signs of decay, Adam and his companion mourned more deeply than men now mourn over the dead. The death of the frail, delicate flowers was indeed a flower a cause of sorrow, but when the goodly trees cast off their leaves, the scene brought vividly to mind the stern fact that death is the portion of every living thing. The Garden of Eden remains upon the earth long after man, excuse me, remained upon the earth long after man became an outcast from its pleasant paths. The fallen race were long permitted to gaze upon the home of innocence their entrance barred only by the watching angels. At the cherubim-guarded gate of paradise, the divine glory was revealed. Hither came Adam and his sons to worship God. Here they renewed their vow of obedience to that law, the transgression of which had banished them from Eden. When the tide of iniquity overspread the world and the wickedness of men determined their destruction by a flood of waters, the hand that had planted Eden, withdrew it from the earth. But in the final restitution, when there shall be a new heaven and a new earth, it is to be, that is from Revelation 21, 1, it is to be restored more gloriously adorned than at the beginning. Ellen White, Patriarchs and Prophets, page 62. You know what just blows me away to think about that? The Garden of Eden was there. And the people who lived before the flood, all those wicked people, could march over there and stand there and see the angels guarding the gate and look into the Garden of Eden, and they could still do all the foolishness that they were doing. It just, that, that's, that's almost beyond comprehension to me. But they were free to make yeah. choices. They were free. Have you ever tried to imagine what their family did when either Adam or Eve died? How did Cain's descendants get along with Seth's descendants? What do we know about that? Unfortunately, we know that Seth's descendants, the man, looked at some of the good-looking women that were, Seth's de uh, were Cain's descendants, and that was one of the major reasons why things deteriorated. Well, there was a lot of death in the Old Testament. Think of the sacrifices that were offered every day at the temple. Remember that the whole point of the sacrificial system of the Old Testament was to remind people that sin leads to death. Unfortunately, we have become so accustomed to death that we often just take it for granted. 
we were never supposed to experience death either ourselves or to have anyone or, or anything around us die. Um, and I'm looking at the time. Well, we can look at a few of these verses. Look at Isaiah 57, verse 1. Good people die and no one understands or even cares, but when they die, no calamity can hurt them. Revelation 21, 4, he will wipe, this is God, will wipe away all tears from their eyes. There will be no more death, no more grief or crying or pain. The old things have disappeared. 1 Thessalonians 4, 17 and 18, then we who are living at that time will be gathered up along with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so we will always be with the Lord. So then, encourage one another with these words. Matthew 5, 4, happy are those who mourn. God will comfort them. 2 Samuel 18, 33, the king was overcome with grief. He went up to the room over the gateway and wept. As he went, he cried, oh, my son, my son Absalom. This is, of course, David after uh, Solomon, just when he learned that Absalom was dead. Absalom, my son, if only I had died in your place, my son, Absalom, my son. And just Genesis 37, 34, Jacob tore his clothes in sorrow and put on sackcloth. He mourned for his son. He thought Joseph was dead for a long time. So these per verses make it very clear that people normally feel terrible when someone close to them dies. We are so fortunate to have a clear biblical explanation from God himself about what happens at death and what the future holds for the dead. But how will we respond if we are inside the New Jerusalem and we see someone who was dear to us outside and about to perish eternally? Is it any wonder that God says he will have to wipe away the tears? Even to imagine such a thing hurts. To lose a spouse, a child, or a parent hurts a lot, and it will lead often to a significant period of hurting, loneliness, and reevaluation of our own lives. So, is it the church's responsibility to try to reach out to those who are hurting following the death of a loved one? The answer or answers to this question will depend to a great degree on the size of your church and the qualifications of those who make up the church. Some churches will have, a qualified, will have qualified counselors or pastors who have been trained to help people at such times. Other smaller churches will not have anyone like that available. Some churches may not even have a regular pastor. In such cases, it may be necessary to reach out to some professionally trained individual. Well, I think everyone know, has ha knows someone who has, uh, for whatever reason, um, a church member, married or not, um, loses a, a partner. And, and or, for whatever reason, they may have become an Adventist after marrying that person. That spouse may approve of their, of their involvement in the church or they may not. How should we relate to those people who are spiritually single? What encouraging words might the Bible have for them? Well, just look at a few passages. Look at Isaiah 54, verse 5. Your Creator will be like a husband to you. The Lord Almighty is His name. The Holy God of Israel will save you. He is the ruler of all the world. And Hosea 2, 19-20. Israel, I will make you my wife. I will be true and faithful. I will show you constant love and mercy and make you mine forever. I will keep, your, keep my promise and make you mine, and you will acknowledge me as Lord. And Psalm 72, 12. He rescues the poor who call to him and those who are needy and neglected. So God is always there. Um, and he wants to be our friend. If the church reaches out to those who are spiritually single or even to their partners, Will it lead to greater animosity? Ideally, a partner might eventually feel that he or she is being won over by the faithfulness of the spouse or the friendliness of the church. That would be ideal. Well, there's a story about someone in the Bible who might give us a clue. In the midst of a life of active labor, Enoch, this is of course from Ellen White, Enoch steadfastly maintained his communion with God. The greater and more pressing his labors, he, um, the more constant and earnest were his prayers. He continued to exclude himself at certain periods from all society. After remaining for a time among the people, laboring to benefit them by instruction and example, he would withdraw to spend his season in solitude, 
hungering and thirsting for that divine knowledge which God alone can impart. Communing thus with God, Enoch came more and more to reflect the divine image. His face was radiant with a holy light, even the light that shineth in the face of Jesus. As he came forth from these divine communings, even the ungodly beheld with awe the impress of heaven upon his countenance. Patriarchs and Prophets, 86 and 87. Do you know anybody whose face is shining? <laughs> do you know any Enix? <laughs> Not really. Or wouldn't, God wouldn't do that to someone today, right? I think we have some advantage in, in counseling people in churches, certainly bigger churches. We're getting Adventist psychologists, and I've come across one or two Adventist psychiatrists. But even there, you've got to be careful. Mm -hmm. I've seen one or two of those folks. Mm -mm. Yeah. An experienced elderly minister might be helpful. An experienced chaplain, hospital chaplain, is probably a good way to go, but it can be done. Do mm -hmm. you feel like you need to... Jackie, were you going to come in? When my dad died, my mom was catatonic mm -hmm. for about a year. Yeah. There was... Uh, she wasn't there. Mm -hmm. You could read to her, you could sing, but she didn't... Par she was like... They're in the room with you, but she just, it was... Yeah. Detached. Yeah. But who brought her through it? All her little old ladies at church. <laughs> they just kept skedaddling her off to Bible study, off to eat, mm -hmm. off to, you know, and it's like us kids were really at a loss, but her little old lady friends at church, mm -hmm. they're the ones that really pulled her through the whole thing. Mm -hmm. Some we, of them probably been through it themselves. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Well, do you sometimes feel that you need to get away for a period of Bible study and reflection? Do you think you can tell by talking to other people or even looking at them if they are truly lonely? Do you know what the people in the church around you are going through? Do we, do we really, we sometimes call them Christian brothers and sisters, but do we really know what's happening in their lives? How can I, I grew up in a little tiny church. Me too. And about half the people in the church were related. And in a case like that, everybody did, did just about because we and all the kids went to school together. So you know, we were <coughs> pretty much familiar with what was going on with the rest of the people in that church. Well, um, how can the church learn to be more sensitive to individual needs? If your church is large enough, it may be appropriate to form a singles group. What kind of activities would be appropriate for a church to conduct in which they would invite especially singles to participate? I mean, it would be perfectly fine to have a church potluck and invite singles, right? And uh, even a group will get together and, and invite someone to our homes for Sabbath meal. Um, and outings could be organized, hikes, group hikes to view flowers and mountains and so forth. So, what about it? Do you think you could live a life like, like Paul did? Maybe without all the beatings and the... <laughs> <laughs> the uh, oh, wow. Does it matter whether you choose the time of quiet and separation for, from, from others or whether it was forced upon you by circumstances? We will never solve the problem of loneliness here on this earth. God in the future kingdom of heaven and then on this earth is the only ultimate answer to loneliness. We have discussed various things which have interrupted even the best of relationships. There was a young man who decided he wanted to live alone. He went to a remote part of Alaska where he kept a journal of how things were going. He lasted about a hundred days until he finally died of starvation. He wrote in his journal, Gary? What was that? He, what did the young man write in his journal? I think that's... Happiness only real when shared. So yeah. 
I was thinking about Alaska. Anybody that goes up there has got to know how to survive. Yeah. He seemed to me a little bit, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? He went up there grossly unprepared. Yeah. It's almost always true that the greatest happiness comes when we share circumstances with others. Perhaps that's why God said, it is not good for the man to live alone, Genesis 2.18, that we started with. That expression in Hebrew for not good was not used again until Jethro admonished Moses, what you're doing is not good. Remember when they finally got down to the Mount Sinai and Jethro heard that they were there and brought Moses' wife and kids to him. And he watched him and he was all day long dealing with this case and that case and this question and that question. He was just nonstop activity. And Jethro said, that, that's not good. Is that what God said too? Well, God seemed to approve of what Jethro said to Moses from what happened. Well, Moses was wearing himself out. I don't yeah. see that God would have really felt negative about it. Well, God could have easily, looking back even to Adam and Eve, God could have easily <clears throat> created Adam and Eve together at the same time. However, he did not. Why didn't he? Adam had a chance to be lonely. And it's to point out that Eve never had a chance to be lonely. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, did Adam learn something important while he was alone? He wasn't alone for very long. No. Did Eve feel that she was cheated by not being there from the beginning? Well, remember that Eve was not only Adam's wife, but also his companion, his friend, his co-worker, his spiritual associate. They were together with everything. They were everything to each other. So it is possible to be not alone even if you're not... Is it possible to be not alone even if you're not married? Mm -hmm. Well, talking about being alone and making decisions, think about the story of Eve at the Tree of Knowledge of Good and Evil. Was she there alone? Mm. Ah. Not really, the devil was there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Where was Adam? Well... There is a disagreement among scholars as to whether Adam was present with Eve during the serpent's temptation. The argument that he was present revolves around two points. The text speaking of Eve's eating the fruit and giving some to her husband with her, and the serpent using plural verbs as if he is talking to more than one person. In support of Adam's absence, he is conspicuously absent from the dialogue and appears neither as the subject or the object of any sentence in the narration. There is an exclusive verbal volley between Eve and the serpent. He the serpent said unto the woman, and the woman said unto the serpent. The controversial phrase with her can be understood in a relational rather than spatial context as in the way Adam retold events to God. The woman whom thou gavest to be with me, she gave me of the tree and I did eat. Obviously, with me in Adam's words means me with me as my companion, and with her in the narrator's words likely means the same thing. As far as the serpent as far as the serpent using plural verbs and pronouns, this diction shows that Satan's target was both Adam and Eve. The use of plurals would make it all the more surprising that Adam didn't speak up if he were indeed there. For a brief study of the subject, see Elias Brazil de Zusa. Was Adam with Eve at the scene of temptation? Okay. Would the fall have been prevented if Adam and Eve had stayed together? From Ellen White, well, Patriarchs. Just, just wait. I want, I want you to answer the question before you read what Ellen White said. <laughs> if they had <sighs> consulted with each other, I think there's a good chance they would not have uh, fallen. Okay. You know, what would have been perfect, even if, that, even if Eve was by herself, she should have said, because remember, where was the tree of knowledge of good and evil located? In the center of the garden, near the tree of life. Near the tree of life. 
She'll be so, there every day. Yeah, she should have said, hey, this tree is right here. I've seen it every day of my life. It'll be here tomorrow. I'll check with Adam. I'll check with God. I'll be back tomorrow. Wouldn't that have been ideal? But she didn't. What she needed to check with God for, he's already given her instruction. Yeah, but... I mean, God doesn't uh, isn't do a lot of redundancy. This is a, the, remember, this is the first time anybody had ever lied to her. So what do you well, do? Well, and the lies were not all that uh, e egregious. They were very deceptive. Yeah. But the serpent it, was but beautiful. Based, based upon the past experience of, of Satan, there was no death. Mm -hmm. So if what had happened before, probably... but. The equation of uh, put Jesus or God in the equation, and it uh, you all you all may not may know maybe you don't know that um, Martin Luther wrote a yeah. commentary on the Book of Genesis, and he said, if Adam had been there, he would have said no. <laughs> <laughs> so it was Eve's fault. <laughs> well, Martin Luther would say yes. Very Teutonic. <laughs> okay, what did Ellen White tell us? Now from Patriarchs and Prophets 53 plus. The angels had cautioned Eve to beware of separating herself from her husband while occupied in their daily labor in the garden. Now I'm going to interrupt for a second. Didn't that a, a separation warning also apply to Adam? Absolutely. Okay, go ahead. So why did he let her go? With him she would be in less danger from temptation than if she were alone. But absorbed in her pleasing task, she unconsciously wandered from his, from his side. He didn't allow it to happen to her. Mm -hmm. <laughs> On perceiving that she was alone, she felt an apprehension of danger, but dismissed her fears, deciding that she had sufficient wisdom and strength to discern evil and to withstand it. Unmindful of the angel's caution, she soon found herself gazing with mingled curiosity and admiration upon the forbidden tree. Now I'm going to ask you for a question. What do you think she was doing that, ha that led her, and how did she get led to the forbidden tree? Well, she went on her own, but then she didn't turn around and go straight back to Adam. She sort of got deeper and deeper into the bog as it went along. Yeah, She I mean, was just going towards the tree of life. Was she just going toward the tree of life? Well, you wonder, I mean, what, it's close, what, what, you know, she, they were told to, to care for and keep the garden. What, what did that consist of? Well, I've often wondered, uh, you, you sort of imagine heaven as being perfect and nothing dies, mm -hmm. but it sounds like we're gardening. Now, what do we do? Prune them back so they grow bigger? You know what I'm saying? There's a mm -hmm. whole thing there that we don't know much about. Well, the fruit was... Oh, go ahead, Gordon. Uh, repeating the last sentence. Unmindful of the angel's caution, she soon found herself gazing with mingled curiosity and admiration upon the forbidden tree. The fruit was very beautiful, and she questioned with herself why God had withheld it from them. Now was the tempter's opportunity. As if he were able to discern the workings of her mind, he addressed her. Yea, hath God said, Ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden? Eve was surprised and startled as she thus seemed to hear the echo of her thoughts. But the serpent continued in a musical voice with subtle praise of her sur surpassing loveliness. And his words were not displeasing. In let, let me interrupt you there for again a second. The Hebrew, the way the Hebrews were, you know, it says up here, you shall not eat of every tree in the garden. The Hebrew actually suggests that it means every tree. So, you know, did God really say you can't eat of any tree in this garden? That was what he's suggesting to her. Well, they could eat of all the trees, but he warned them if you eat of that one, yeah. death will ensue. But he said, God's, God's trying to really prohibit everything here. And that was Satan's case. implication. Yeah. Instead, uh, continuing with uh, Ellen White, instead of fleeing from the spot, she lingered wonderingly to hear a serpent speak. Had she been addressed by a being like the angels, her fears would have been excited, but she had no <clears throat> thought that the fascinating serpent could become the medium of the fallen foe. 
Wow. Think of what Adam and did, Eve did after their sin. When God came to speak with them, they tried to hide. Sin is a self-damaging condition. They were afraid to be associated with God. But the history of the Old Testament makes it very clear that God has gone to extraordinary lengths to maintain his connection with the human family. He even drowned almost the entire human race in a flood because he realized that he had almost lost, control, lost contact with the human race. Noah was, Noah was the only one who was still paying attention to God. What if God had waited another generation or two until virtually no one was listening to him? When God was developing a relationship with, children of, of the, with the children of Israel, he set up his tabernacle or tent in the very center of the encampment. Hasn't that always been God's plan for our lives? While human companionship forms a very important part of the lives of many people, each one of us, nevertheless, has an individual need for a relationship with God. If we do not have that relationship, there will be not only spiritual loss, but also a constant hunger for something which we may not even recognize. Jesus promised a woman at the well at Sychar, John 4, a spring of water, welling up to meet her needs. Jesus and the gospel that he has proclaimed is that well of water. Each of us may partake of it. God is always present, as Paul explained in Acts 17, 27. He sees what we are going through, and he promises never to leave us. Genesis 16, 13, Deuteronomy 31, 6, and Matthew 28, 20. The best thing that a person could do who feels lonely is to turn to God. When one has a present and living relationship with God, one can never feel completely alone. God is constantly pursuing us with his love. Think how sad it is for those who believe that God does not exist and that there are naturalistic explanations for the origin of life and our presence on this world. No wonder so many of them are committing suicide. Getting along with others may not always be easy. Scott Cromode, director and Hugh Dupree, professor of leadership development at Fuller's Theological Seminary, has said, in closer relationships, without conflict, there's no honesty. In other words, Human relationships are going to have conflicts. But without honesty, there's no intimacy. And without intimacy, there is no community. Is that why so many people in our world today are lonely? We can't handle the honesty. Our kind and loving Father, we thank you for the privileges we have to have your word to, to, to turn to if in, in any kind of the problems of life. We thank you for your promise to be with us wherever we may be and under whatever circumstances. Help us not to be lonely, but to always feel your presence is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.